Hello, everybody. This is Brian with Anita Good Design, and I would like to welcome you to our live Stitch Along event. Um, this is the second, I believe, of the live Stitch Along event that we are doing here at Anita Good Design. And today, what we're going to be doing in class, so to speak, is the floral cinch bag. Now, this project is not something that you need to have right now, so don't panic if you don't. Uh, this video will be rewatchable, and they're actually going to post it to our YouTube page as well. So you have plenty of time to get the project, go back and rewatch this. If you are watching live, also don't worry about uh, keeping up with me as well. Um, again, you'll be able to go back and rewatch this, but if you are watching live, it's going to really help you just kind of walk through the project the same way watching me live at an event describe how to do these directions would help you go forth with them as well. Now, the Anita's Express Floral Cinch Bag is uh, currently on sale on our website today, the 25th of September until 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time for $10 off. So you still have time to go get that at a discounted amount. Um, or after this, you can go get it at your leisure at any time. So we're going to go ahead and dive right in. And as we're doing this project, um, I'm obviously going to have some downtime because I will be stitching it out. Um, I'm going to give away some prizes as well, and I'll explain that here in just a bit. Um, so once again, if you're just joining in, just remember that this video will be rewatchable on our YouTube page, um, as, as well as other outlets as well. So again, don't panic if, uh, um, you're, you're not exactly able to follow along. It's not a big deal right now. Um, so to move along with the floral cinch bag, um, we actually, after the first event and I uh, got feedback from you guys, we're always interested in feedback and want to know what we can do better to make this virtual experience even better for you is that, uh, we switched camera angles. So, um, you might see, uh, right beside me, I have a cell phone right here. Uh, this is actually facing first person perspective to the hoop. So when we switch camera angles while this is stitching out and while I'm doing any hoop work, you'll be able to see it the same way when we do live feeds at events, for instance. Um, all of that right here, what I'm doing in the hoop, will be first-person perspective to you. Now, I'm not going over any machine features. I'm not going to guide you through how to use the interface on your machine because this is not a machine uh, class. This is a project class. Uh, so if you have any questions about your machine, how to operate it, or the actual interface, just give your dealer a call where you actually got it from, and they'll be more than happy to help walk you through how to do any functions that you may need to know how to do. So let's go ahead and dive right in to our project. Um, for those of you who have actually uh, gone ahead and prepped for this um, and are ready to actually do it live with me, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter which project you do from Floral Cinch Bag. We have multiple designs in that actual collection, the Anita's Express collection. Um, the technique is the exact same. And technique is what I want to touch on right now because at Anita Good Design, we have a core set of fundamental techniques. Once you learn those fundamental techniques, you're able to apply them to all the different thousands of collections that we have. So some things we're going to learn today is um, embroidery. Uh, we're going to be making an actual freestanding drawstring bag is the uh, hopeful end result on this. And you're actually also going to learn a technique that is very similar, it's actually pretty much dead on to folded fabric. And I'll touch on that. It's not exactly listed in the iconology for this project, um, but I'm going to reiterate what that actually is and how it can apply to a lot of different other things in the Anita Good Design uh, catalog. So for our project, I'm going to go ahead and um, use the picture steps as I go along through this so that when you're going through your tutorial, you'll be able to look at the picture steps and follow along with me. In tandem, I'm going to be... Um, going over my number steps, and I'll show you how to access those here in just a moment. Um, but I'm not gonna specifically harp on the number steps because your number steps will be relative to the design you choose. Now, all of our tutorials that need a good design work the same way. If you download this off of the website, it will be a PDF file uh, with tutorial in the title for it, uh, Floral Cinch Bag Tutorial. When you open up our tutorials, the first thing, and I have this um, through opened up in our uh, um, September all access so our club members would receive this actual book here. But I've opened up to the page for the floral cinch bags. 
If you downloaded this, you can print off these pages or open it up on a tablet, your laptop, whatever you like. When we first get in here, the first page is just going to, and let me back up. I'm actually walking you through how our tutorials work first before we dive in. Um, so the first page is really just going to tell you about it. The second uh, pages are going to kind of dive in about some tips and tricks, introduce you to what you're looking for. It's also uh, going to give you the actual materials list. Um, not everything we create gives you a full materials list, but projects do. So when we give you a project, we know exactly what you're going to make. So we list out everything you will need there. Um, some of those being, for those of you watching, just to reiterate and make sure you have the proper things to start off with, we're going to be using Caraway Stabilizer uh, times two, so two pieces, because this is a uh, project done in two hooping and designed to fit the hoop required based on the size of the project you pick. Uh, then you're going, of course, just refer to your materials list for the fabric that you need, the notion, et cetera. Um, moving on, uh, it goes into just talking about choosing fabrics. So our tutorials in the very beginning will kind of give you tips and tricks, materials list. Then we get into our design pages. Now, I don't need a good design. If you're not familiar with our uh, actual designs, we stitch out every single thing we create. We scan it in. And then when we write the tutorial, we actually go ahead and put the scanned image of the finished product in there. So you can actually see, there's just an example. This isn't the exact one I'm doing in class. But as you flip through the pages, you'll notice there's a scanned image of the finished product. And at the bottom, it has the file name. So when you actually go to your um, computer, CD, whatever the case may be, you know exactly what the file name refers to because there is a picture reference in here. And most importantly, this picture is exactly what it looks like when we stitched it out. So if you're noticing anything different, um, there could be a number of reasons why, uh, but you would always refer to the actual photograph to see, to make sure that uh, that's where those differences would lie. So once we get past the actual design in this specific tutorial, we come to our picture steps. Now this is what I'm going to be using in class because when I teach events, if you've ever been to one of our events on the actual uh, projector or TV screens, we actually click through all these picture steps and I describe them. So in class, that's what I'm going to be doing for you as well. Um, but at home, what I recommend you do is you use your number steps in tandem with these. Now, the picture steps are letters because they do not correspond with your machine steps. The reason is, is because, uh, for instance, step A here says to begin, hoop a layer of tearaway stabilizer. Uh, now, currently, the top model machines do not hoop your stabilizer for you. Yes, I'm sure one day you'll just hit print and a king size quilt will come out. But as of right now, you're still actually hooping your stabilizer um, and doing other things by hand. So this is actually showing you things you do with your hands, as well as what the machine is doing, which is why we have them lettered. And that's what I'm going to be referring to as we move throughout the project. Uh, moving on, we also have our number steps. Now, if you're looking in your all access book, this would be in the back of the book. If you have the PDF, you'll see them in there. It uh, comes up for you. But the number steps, again, has the scanned image picture, has the file name. The file name will be in bold below the picture. Below that, it tells you the sizes that it comes in. Uh, this one, for instance, has a B size and a C size, and it gives you the hoop range. So you know exactly what hoop you need to pick. Um, I used a hoop larger than what's required. Don't let that throw you off. Uh, just pick a hoop that's closest to the size that you want to use. That way you're minimizing the amount of stabilizer you have to waste. Uh, below that is our number steps. Now these numbers refer to exactly what your machine is doing. So if you're familiar with the machine's interface, it will say, for instance, you're on step four of 16. If there's a total of 16 steps, I would look at my number step. I would say decorative tacking stitch. And then if I'm confused about any definitions going on in the number steps, I refer back to my picture steps to go ahead and see what it's talking about. So using the numbers and pictures in tandem is the way I recommend doing it in class and at home until you're really familiar with all of our fundamental techniques. Um, at Anita Good Design, we don't have either one of those. We just start off with a bunch of uh, pictures on a digitized paper and we have to write it all ourselves. Um, I always talk about how it's like reading the matrix. 
where eventually you kind of uh, understand it all, but we make this end result for you very easy to follow with. Okay, so now that we've gone through all of that, um, how about before we get stitching, I go ahead and give away a prize. Does that sound good? I can't hear any yelling. What about you guys? Can you yell for me? There we go. Makes me feel a little bit better since we're not in person. <laughs> uh, by the way, we do have several moderators in here, Gretchen, Elise, Hadley, and uh, Lauren all the way in the back. So they'll all be here responding to your comments and moving the cameras around for me. We have Karen from New Zealand joining us. Karen from New Zealand. Wow. I don't know what time it is there, but uh, I'm happy to have you here with us. Is it tomorrow? In New Zealand? Yeah, or is it yesterday? <laughs> Pretty close. All right, so the way this prize thing is going to work is I'm going to give you a word that you just type in into the comments, and the uh, moderators are going to pick a name and tell me that name, and we'll send this out to you. If you're all the way in New Zealand, we may pick the digital route to get that to you. So um, don't fret if you're too far for any mailing or anything like that. Uh, we'll make sure you get the design physical or digital either way. Uh, the first prize I have here is Christmas Plant Cozy. It is also a project, um, like the one we're doing today is a project. This gives you the materials list, step-by-step -step pictures, everything to go along with it. Now, the word I want you to type in the uh, actual comment is chronos and classic and vidibulum. The <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're just gonna use a simple one. How about bag? Just type bag in the comments, B-A-G, and go ahead and type those in. I'll move along while they pick a winner, and uh, I'll announce that winner here momentarily. The word again is bag. <laughs> All right. Now, before we jump in on this project, we have to remember this is going to be done in two hooping. Now, I have two hoops here with me, so I went ahead and hooped my stabilizer, in each hoop, I have one on the machine and one here. It just makes it easy for me. If you don't have two hoops that will fit the size file, that's fine. You're gonna be popping one out of the hoop, the first file that is anyway. It's very important to note that there are a lot of different files for the front of the bag because that has the embroidered design on it, but there are only a few files for the back of the bag. Um, now that back of the bag is going to have a letter that would correspond with the size that you pick. So um, what you want to do is always hoop the back of the bag first. So if you're looking at your files and it says FCB back and then has a letter after it, just pick the letter that corresponds with the size that you picked for the front of the bag. You have to load the back of the bag first, otherwise this project won't work. If you're brand new to this and you're scared about ruining any fabric because you're afraid to mess up, well, my motto is fail faster. Um, I love getting through and figuring out how many different ways I can mess something up so I know how to do it properly. But you don't want to do that with expensive fabrics, so using scraps or just cheap muslin, whatever you can come across. Um, it's a great way just to practice things real quick. So again, we're going to load the back of the bag first. I've gone ahead and loaded um, my file, uh, which let me back out. I'll tell you exactly which file I'm using. Um, so if you're watching this later and you literally want to do the exact bag I'm doing, you can. Uh, let's see here. Um, I chose uh, the file FCB 12B as in boy. So I chose the back FCB back B. Notice the last letter of each file is B. That means they're going to be the same size. That's very important. So the first thing I'm going to load is FCB back B. Again, if you chose a different file, use a different file, it's totally fine. Um, but if you're brand new, I know some people absolutely love following along with the exact thing that I'm doing. But the technique is the same regardless. Um, so before I move along, let's see that winner there. It's on the banner. Oh, sorry. Is it on the banner? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm, uh, this is why I'm not moderating comments. <laughs> I'll get that back up there for me. Let me get this loaded here. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's lagged on there. Sandra Tinsley, Sandra or Sandra, however you pronounce it, congratulations, you are our first winner. <laughs> and we'll get that uh, Christmas plant cozy on out to you. All right. So I've gone ahead and uh, loaded my file. Now I'm going to be running my first couple steps to contrast the thread to the fabric I'll be using. Um, when you're doing this at home, we recommend 
uh, for any tack down stitches or things like that, that you get a thread that's closest to your fabric. So the fabric I will be using is this uh, lavenderish fabric. So the thread I would initially use if I wasn't doing this live to teach you would be a thread that is pretty close to the color. But I'm going to be using a black thread so it shows up on camera here for you so you can exactly see the stitches that I'm talking about. All right, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. So step A, if you're following along with me, this is going to be going over the back of the bag first. Then when we do our second hooping, the second set of picture steps will go over how to do the front of the bag and combine it all together. So step A talks about uh, going ahead and hooping your tearaway stabilizer. We've done that. Whenever you hoop stabilizer, it's very important to make sure that it's nice and taut like the head of a drum. There's no wrinkles, no ripples, and um, that way it doesn't draw in, pucker, or pop out of your hoop as you're going, and I always make sure I've tightened it as well. Again, that's going to vary depending on the model that you have, the type of hoop you have, um, so just familiarize yourself with that. If you haven't, again, you can contact your dealer for more information. Step B is going to be run the first machine step of this design. Uh, now, first and foremost, that would send me to the number steps, right? Because we talked about using those in tandem. So I would look at step one, read it completely, and then refer back to the picture step. Uh, so also in step B, this will be our placement stitch for your fabric that shows you the overall shape of the bag. And so I'm going to go ahead and run that while I explain this. So at a need a good design, we use placement stitches um, as our paint by numbers approach to embroidery and quilting. So you don't ever put anything into an actual um, hoop, uh, or I should say it's very rare, that you would ever put anything down uh, in terms of fabric, uh, batting, anything really, without a marking stitch or a placing stitch to guide you as to where to place that in the hoop. This particular placement stitch, which uh, you can see on uh, screen, it, which is that uh, showing up good enough on screen for everyone? Okay, yeah, I can see it there. I just want to make sure. Uh, that's why I use a black thread on this white stabilizer for you. It has, of course, the general shape of the bag, and you can see these little notches sticking out at the very top on that straight edge. Those notches are going to come in handy when we make our channels for this cinched bag. Um, Lauren and I completely forgot. Do we have a finished bag lying around in here? I know we do. Somewhere. I'll get you one of those and uh because I uh, forgot to show you exactly <laughs> in person uh, what we're actually making here. Um, so uh, it's, it's gonna come in handy because we're making a cinch bag, but we're gonna be feeding drawstrings through it. So it's gonna have a channel to feed the drawstrings through. So to make more sense of that, this top line up here is going to help us guide to make the channels. So here's an example of one finished cinched bag. You can see I have the drawstrings in and everything. And this is ready to use right when you take it out. There's no additional sewing or anything, but you can see it has the channels built in there. And this uses our folded fabric technique that I mentioned in the intro. So, pun intended, we'll go ahead and uh, start with, step, or uh, continue rather with step C. So we're gonna lay our fabric right side down. If your fabric is directional like this, where one side has the actual print on it and the other does not, if it is directional, you're gonna put uh, the right side down. If it's non-directional, it doesn't matter. So right side down, only over the line of the top edge of the placement stitch as shown in step C. So you can see in step C how they're doing it, and you can watch me how I'm doing it. So if I put this in here, it's gonna hang off the top of my hoop, which is totally fine. Um, you can line it up dead on with that line, but I like to pull it just a little bit further down. Um, this will help prevent on home machines, this presser foot rides low. And if there's any opportunity for that presser foot to get under fabric, it will always take advantage of it. And I'll get into more of that here when we start taping stuff. So step C, we laid our fabric right side down only over the line of the top edge of the bag. So that whole top line there. You'll also notice I cut, I overcut my fabric. Um, so it's much larger than what I needed. If you're trying to cut precise, which I know a lot of you do, uh, you need it to just barely go past those lines just for a good measure. So that's what those two outside notches are. It's showing you how wide you need to cut your bag. The length of what you need to cut needs to be longer than the actual outline you see here. 
Uh, I would say by um, uh, just give it a two inches until you really get familiar with the actual project. Moving on to step D. Now, if you're at home, I would recommend going ahead and uh, taping just right here on the edge, like you can see they did in step T, uh, D rather. They used uh, pink embroidery tape. That's what we like to use. Just a pro tip, um, painter's tape is uh, works okay but it doesn't adhere to fabric as well. And the adhesive on painter's tape is not meant for embroidery machines. It can gum up the needles over time, which just means you're cleaning it more or it can lead to thread breakage, et cetera. So the pink uh, embroidery tape, um, you can inquire about it to your dealer. I would recommend um, when you're purchasing anything I'm talking about um, in terms of materials, list, notions, all that stuff, please go see your dealer first. We wanna try to make sure that uh, we can keep business local. So. I'll go ahead and uh, drop my presser foot and I'm gonna run the next step. Um, now, I'm gonna go over the notes that you're seeing in D once I run this step here, cause I'm gonna show you on this. So we're gonna run this next step as I'm doing right now to secure the fabric in place. This step stitches upside down L shape on the left and right edges of the fabric. And I'm gonna explain exactly what this is and how we use it. But this is part being used as a folding stitch and part of it's being used as a pattern marker as to where we're going to cut the fabric. This is how we're going to create the channel at the top of our bag. So let me go ahead and pull this out here and I'll give you a bit closer look. Um, I didn't use tape because I'm dangerous. But if you can switch over to, yeah, perfect. Uh, there's a there's a bit of a lag on the camera I'm seeing, so if uh, you see me uh, questioning things, it's just because it hasn't popped up on my screen yet. Nobody saw it. Um, so on here, and you can see in the picture also, they kind of uh, highlighted it out. Note the different plies of the stitches on top. They're single ply basting stitches. Then halfway down the vertical line, it changes to a two ply tack down stitch, as you can see there. So what we want to do is uh, we're going to first trim horizontally all the way over to where the vertical line is. And we're gonna match that trim with the horizontal. Now I'll trim it first and show you. And what we're doing here is the edges of the channel itself are going to be folded in. So it's not an ugly raw edge staring you in the face. Uh, so the edges of that channel will be folded in, and that's what we're doing with this step. So I trim one side, I trim the other, and it can be slightly above the line, slightly below that line. You don't have to pop out. You don't have to cut exactly on the line itself, and you don't have to be, the cuts don't have to be as pretty as mine are. Look at that nice, crisp, non-jagged edge right there. That's That's a beauty. <laughs> That's what uh, six years of experience will get you. <laughs> so next, I'm going to take my seam ripper, and wherever that single ply basting stitch is, I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Now you don't have to pop every single one out. Typically, they usually come out pretty easy. That's why we use a basting stitch. Uh, basting stitches we use oftentimes that they need a good design as either um, placement guides or as uh, to hold down something temporarily, pattern markers, et cetera, because they can be easily removed. So now that I've removed that, you can see what I did was uh, I went ahead and ran it in step D. I went ahead and trimmed it just like I did in step E using that pair of scissors it trimmed along the horizontal edge of the L shape as shown to create the tabs that are about a half inch wide. So again, you can see in the photographs in your tutorial, they actually pre-cut the fabric much closer. And then in step F, I went ahead and used the seam ripper to remove the basing stitches of the L shape, um, annotated in this with the red dashed lines. And I left those two ply stitches. You can see in black here, I left those. It's very important because that is our folding stitch. Where at a need a good design, our folded fabric techniques are done in three steps. We have a placement stitch, which was the stitch we used to actually place the fabric in the beginning. So that was our guide to place it. We have a folding stitch, which is typically done as a two-ply stitch um, that goes back and forth. 
And that allows us, when we fold this over, to get a nice, crisp, folded edge, just like you would see with paper piecing or with uh, hand piecing. And that's the technique this minute. So when we fold it over, that folded edge is right there. It takes the guesswork out. Um, it does say here, take care to not remove the two-ply stitches. If you do remove it, your fabric won't have that folding stitch, which is what I was touching on there. All right, so now step G is the one I'm currently on. In step G, make sure I want to do lock stitches here. Um, as you can see in the picture, I'm going to fold the tabs over, pulling it taut against that folded stitch. Now, I'm going to show you how I taped it here. Um, there's several different ways you can do it. Everybody has their different preference on how to do it. Uh, some people prefer, I'm, I'm showing you two different ways, the way I taped it in this. One way is you can tape all along that edge there. The other way is you can just tape along the bottom. Either one is fine. It's going to really come down to your machine and how your presser foot is because, again, as I mentioned earlier, if there's an opportunity for it to uh, the presser foot to get under loose fabric and it moves across that loose fabric, it typically will sew that loose fabric to the presser foot and pull your whole design out of the hoop, uh, which is not what we want. Um, a lot of people like putting it at the bottom because it prevents the actual tape from being stitched over. It's not, in my opinion, really that big of a deal. Um, I like putting it vertically like this because the presser foot's gonna do our folding stitch, which is shown in step H. And as the presser foot goes along those raw edges, it's when it comes back this way, um, or when it goes this way rather, it won't go under that fabric. So to prevent that from happening while I'm doing a live stitch out, I'm gonna go ahead and completely cover that up and we'll just pull the tape out later on again either way you want to do it to show you one way in the picture steps i just gave you a different tip um six one out doesn't the other there's a lot of different ways to do this all right so we've gone ahead and folded those tabs in i have my nice folded edge along those two ply stitches and we're going to go to step h which is running the machine step to stitch the folding stitch so this is going to allow us to flip the whole bag, uh, the top of the bag, rather. Or excuse me, let me rephrase that because we're doing the back of the bag. The uh, uh, right side down edge is going to flip right side up once you run that folding stitch. Let me pull this back up here. All right, so before we flip that over, and this is what I tell everyone, before you hit that start button, read your number step, look at the number on your machine, and really know what you're about to actually run. So it's kind of like the old saying, uh, measure twice, cut once. It's the same principle here, but it's really just reading your directions uh, twice before you actually go. Stop that presser foot and we'll run across. Now right here, it's a good example of if that raw edge was still sticking up, how low that presser foot is, it just risks it getting caught underneath it. I've just seen it happen in class. I've taught drawstring bags, um, so, I don't know. I've taught over a uh, thousand different projects and classes <laughs> uh, over the years. So I've taught this one quite many times. I've seen just about every mistake that can happen, although uh, people tend to surprise me sometimes. I surprise myself more often than you guys do, though. So once that's done, I'm going to remove this tape. The reason is, is because I just don't want it inside my channel for the drawstring. Um, the reason I don't want it inside, uh, for some of you, it would just bug you to know that there's tape inside there. But for me, when I go to actually feed my drawstring in later, it's just one more thing it can get caught on as I'm trying to feed it through. So I'll go ahead and remove that tape. This was just a single ply stitch. Um, I'll show you why at the very end why we did that as, sing as a single ply stitch. Um, and I'll, I'll reiterate that. But essentially, it's because that single ply would show on the fold, or that double ply would stay in there. This single ply base stitch, we can actually pull out at the very end, which will show up as bobbin. So that's why we did it that way. Almost all other folding stitches will be double ply though. So we're gonna go ahead and fold this whole thing down, just like in step I. We're gonna make sure we use our uh, God-given irons and give it a nice folded crease there. Pull it down. You can use another piece of tape if you like to tape it nice and taut to the bottom. 
and make sure there's no wrinkles or anything. Of course, you want to press your fabric before you use it. And we'll move over to step J. Now, this is not going to tack the whole thing down. Uh, so you do want to have excess on your fabric here. And just that's fine. I'll explain that in a moment. I'll drop my presser foot. Make sure the latch is down. <laughs> and press go. Um, and I say make sure the latch is down. That's just on the model I use. You all will have different machines. So just refer to the one you're using. This is going to tack down below the channel. So you can see we created our channel up here. And it's going to do a nice decorative stitch because aesthetically it just looks better at the very end. Um, there's a candle wick stitches they use there, Lauren. I think it looks like it. Yeah. So candle wick decorative stitches. I can't get close enough to look without uh, knocking the, uh, my friend here, the cell phone. So once we're done using this, we're going to uh, remove it from the hoop and we're going to load our front of the bag. So while this is stitching, what are, uh, what, what are some of the comments we have coming through here? Love the bag. It would make a beautiful bride to make it, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, we did, um, that is a, a, a great thing. Um, so we use a lot of different fabrics for our samples. Uh, we love playing with fabric. Um, uh, this one, which is, uh, what is that, velvet? <laughs> this one is uh, a, a fake velvet, velourish thing, kind of like uh, my track suit that I typically wear when I go shopping on Saturdays. And um, uh, because it's a little bit lofted, uh, we would typically use a water-soluble topping on top of this embroidery to help keep it from sinking into the loft that you see here. But we like using things that have texture. We like using um, uh, printed fabrics, plain fabrics, and contrasting threads with those, doing tonals. There are literally a lot of different uh, great tutorials um, on our website on how we actually pick colors of thread and fabric, as well as different types we use and toppings, stabilizers, everything you would need, just go to our website, anitagooddesign.com, uh, go to the customer center, create a login, go to PDF tutorials and video tutorials to see all of that education for free. That's absolutely free for you. All right, so I finished that step on step K in the picture step, and we're going to go down to step L. So step K says once finished, remove the design from the hoop. So. You can go ahead and uh, pop it out of your hoop, or if you want, you can literally just tear it out of your hoop, but just be careful. If your tear away is a heavier weight, um, or depending on the brand even, sometimes you might rip the stitches if you try to pull too hard. So that's, uh, you know, what you can do there. Tear it on out, and I'll go ahead and load the next design. So this next one, I've already hooped it. We're going to go ahead and hop on in here. Now, you'll, as I'm loading this uh, next file, which is going to be the front of the bag, remember I went over that in the beginning, so if you need to, rewind and rewatch what I talked about then. But, uh, the front of the bag I'm using, because I used uh, FCB back B, I'm using FCB 12B for mine. So I went ahead and pulled that up. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get this first step running while I finish up the steps on this bag. So um, for the back of the bag here, and I'll go over this first step in a minute, uh, step M is saying you can use a seam ripper to remove the bobbin stitches from the top edge. So remember how I told you about us running that single ply for the folding stitch? That's why. So you can actually remove those stitches, get it all cleaned up and all that, which I'll work on as we're stitching out. Once we're done with that, we set the back of the bag to the side. We've gone ahead and loaded our next piece of stabilizer. <clears throat> we pulled up the front of the bag after clearing out the back, and we're going to repeat all the steps we just did for the back of the bag. Now, I'm not going to repeat those with you. You can go back and do that. I'm just going to go ahead and run right through these while we go ahead and give away another prize. So this next prize, that we're going to do 
is an Anita's Express, uh, much like this one is from the same type of uh, project line. And this one is Holiday Heart. Uses running stitches as well as um, different uh, holiday designs to create the aesthetic shape of the heart in there. And the word I want you to type in to pick a winner is Christmas. Go ahead and type in the word Christmas in the comments and they'll pick a winner. All right, so while you guys are typing that in and they're picking a winner, I'm again on step B for the front of my bag because we moved over to the next set of picture steps. And again, step B is literally just telling me to repeat steps B through J from the original picture steps because they're the exact same until we get to the actual embroidery part because this is the decorative side of our bag. So there's a couple things that are uh, pretty important when you're doing this and to reiterate to people who are tuning in, again, make sure that you always load the back of your bag first. If, uh, the way I kind of do it in class is if when I'm walking around and looking at what everybody's doing, if I see somebody stitching their first hooping and you can see embroidery on your actual screen, that means you did not do the back of the bag first. The back of the bag should be a plain bag. That's an easy way just to figure that out. Um, other things, of course, are notions. Like, uh, what do we like to use? It's a pretty popular question that I get at Anita Good Design. Everybody's going to be different in what they prefer. Uh, me personally, whenever I'm uh, uh, trimming up like a really um, intricate appliques, I like curved tip applique scissors. These are double curved. I'll hold those up for you again once I put this back in the hoop. Again, I'm just working my steps. B through J from the original, just like it says in the tutorial. Um, but these were uh, double curved applique scissors that I have here. Ruth Murray, you're our second winner. Congratulations. We will get those holiday hearts on out to you. Again, Ruth Murray, congratulations. All right. Um, so the, the curved tip the applique scissors are double curved tip. The reason I like them double curved is not only because the uh, curved tip at the edge of the blade actually allows me to get into intricate cuts, but that double curve on the handle prevents me from punching my hoop with my fist while I'm trying to actually cut it. So for, for me, um, I don't have huge hands, but they're bigger than most people at events when I'm going around. Um, I find myself punching the hoop a lot when I'm trying to cut with non-double curved applique scissors. Uh, most dealers carry this, so you can check with yours if you're interested in them. Okay, so still stitching along here. I've gone ahead and created my other channel. And now I'm doing basically the what was the last step for the back of the hoop. So this would actually be step J there. Now it says only repeat steps B through J. It's very important. You don't just repeat all of those steps again. Stop at J if you're repeating those steps because we're going to be doing some embroidery here in just a moment. Again, it's mimicking that same type of decorative stitch that we did on the back of the bag there across the top. Kind of give us something uh, nice to look at under our channel. So I'm going to trim this up and get it prepped to attach uh, because essentially we're going to use the back of this bag to attach to the front of the bag. All right. Um, do we have any uh, general questions popping up that you guys would like me to address to the group? Not yet. Okay. Um, remember, you do have uh, moderators in here, so if you do have any general questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we also, for questions regarding uh, product or anything like that, uh, we do have our customer experience at Anita Good Design address as well. Okay. So what I'm doing with this back of the bag, as you can see here, is I'm just removing all the tear away, kind of cleaning it up a bit while this is stitching out. So now that it is done this, you notice what it also did 
is not only that decorative stitch under the fold, but it also gave me that U stitch. So what I've done is I've done steps B through J, but the only difference in J from the previous bag, the back of the bag rather, is that it did that tack down stitch. That's gonna come in handy because it's gonna hold our fabric steady while we do embroidery. So once we get going here, um, a lot of times people get really picky over what threads you use where, but this isn't an actual flower. Ryan, can you show your double turn? Yeah, I sure can. So you can literally a lot of times just pick threads that go with the fabric in general. And you can just put them in whenever you want. It doesn't have to look exactly like a flower unless you really want it to look exactly like a flower. So honestly, I'm not looking at the colors that are in the number steps, but you can follow those if you like. So these are those, uh, which camera are we on here? We'll do the machine camera. Um, Elaine wants to know if water Yes, I will touch on that, certainly. If water soluble can be used, that's a very good question. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, there's no lag. All right, perfect. So um, here's those double curves. You can see it has a curve on the handle as well as the curve on the tip. That way when I'm trimming, you see how my fist isn't literally punching the hoop while I'm trying to trim. This double curve keeps my hand away from the hoop and it curves into the cut to give a much more uh, easier cut, much more easier. As we say here, I don't need a good design. <laughs> All right, let's see here. I'm gonna load up. The next color. Um, so uh, we've got a question about stabilizer. Could water soluble be used in lieu of tearaway in this particular project? It absolutely can. Um, the reason we're using tearaway uh, is just because we're tearing it. <laughs> it's like with, with, with this particular project, it doesn't matter if it's tearaway or water soluble at all. Um, the only time it would matter, and this is typically what I tell people, a lot of people don't like um, using tearaway because it uh, can leave fibers sticking out that just make it clean up a little harder, um, whereas water soluble literally just dissolves completely. And that will typically work unless you're using things that are very delicate, such as Dupioni silk or Shantung silk. Those I've actually stained before with water soluble. Um, I'm not going to mention the brand uh, or anything else like that, um, but uh, I have noticed staining with water soluble uh, when using very delicate types of fabric. So I would always just cut a little piece and uh, rinse it with some water soluble to test before you just dive right in. But most fabrics going to be just fine. Uh, some type of materials also just you don't want to wash either, uh, depending on what you're using really. Um, so it's really up to you, uh, but if you're just using a standard 60-40 cotton, like we are here, that'll be perfectly fine to do. All right. It's, uh, as you can see, running through these embroidery steps, which was uh, step C. So what I want to point out in this picture while this stitch is out is that step C here says, then follow your number steps to stitch out the decorative embroidery of your design. Some people get in class, um, will get uh, frustrated at times and say, how come it doesn't show me pictures for every single step? Well, that's because some collections we create have hundreds of designs and we can't have um, an Encyclopedia Britannica for one collection of uh, pages uh, to go through it all. And it's also not necessary because the number steps eliminate that completely because the number steps here for FCB 12 literally tell me exactly what I need to use with what step. So that's why it says refer to those as you're going along. Let's see here. What color do I want to use next? I put my green back in. Um, oftentimes, some people will say, uh, you know, maybe this should have been the same color as that, and they're steps apart, and you're putting the same thread back on. Why not put them back to back? It's because color is interpretive. It's not exactly what, um, you know, we're, we're not making things always to look completely realistic. Uh, typically, you'll find that uh, we're adamant about colors when it comes to tile scenes because you are actually creating a scene where color does matter more so than it does on an abstract floral stitch design that you see here on these bags, which uh, there's quite a few of them. Let's see. So it's going to do the uh, stems and stuff, which we're um, 
practically uh, more than halfway through the front of this bag. We probably only have about 10 minutes left and we'll be completely done with this project. Um, things that will make you quicker at home in doing this sort of thing is um, having all of your thread and fabric completely pressed, your stabilizer prepped, as well as familiarizing yourself with your machine. Uh, the interface, knowing where everything is that you want to see, um, such as the number steps that you're on, uh, knowing how to really thread your machine is probably going to speed you up faster than anything. Uh, if you have a single needle that you're using, not a multi-needle, uh, knowing how to thread your machine will literally cut your time uh, in half most of the time once you're really fast at it. Uh, it for most of us here in the office, um, we've spent uh, years on these machines. So we're pretty familiar with them, and it doesn't take us long to just switch threads out. And uh, when I do that at events um, to help somebody out, and I switch a thread out, they look at me like I'm a wizard. Because, <laughs> like, I'll oh, show off, or how'd you do that so fast? It's only because uh, we had been on machines for 40 hours a week for uh, years for some of us. Uh, so it's just practice. But literally, after a month of working at an Eat a Good Design, I, I'm no faster than I was then. It doesn't take long to get to know your machine and get to know how to really thread things quickly. I'm gonna give away one more prize here shortly. Um, I'll go ahead and show you what it is because I'm gonna switch threads here on the final run here. So we are now on step for this particular design. I'm just gonna say the final step. I'm not gonna say a number because if you're not doing the one I'm doing, it'll throw you off, but I'm on the final step of my design. Now, on this, this is gonna be referring to step D in finishing your bag. Before the very last step, lay the back of the bag that you previously created, which this guy, which I terribly cleaned up. <laughs> you do a better job at home. Um, but we're going to lay the bag right side down over the front of the bag, lining up the top edges with each other. Now, this is much bigger than the actual U for the bottom of the bag, which is great. So what I wanna do here, is match up the channels at the top. And remember, the channels are the same size, which is perfect. So I'm just gonna line that up as best I can there. We'll get it all taped into place. They are yelling for a prize right now. Oh, don't you worry, I've got your prize. <laughs> As soon as I get this running, I'm going to give that prize away. And uh, just to uh, tag you along a bit longer, it's a premium plus. It's a $250 retail value. And it's holiday extravaganza. And we're going to wait just a bit longer. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm trying my best. It's been a while since I've done a project, actually, since... Uh, a long time, I think, <laughs> since I've actually done a project for class. So this final step, I've lined up my top channels. Now you have those decorative stitches that match up on both sides. You also have the actual channel. That's what you want to match up completely. You also want to make sure the back of your bag is completely covering any stitches that you can see for the bottom of the actual bag. Uh, now step E, we're going to run the final step of your design to secure the back of the bag to the front. So I'm gonna go ahead and start that. Of course, uh, before I start that, it would be helpful if I put some thread in the machine. So <laughs> this last step, I'm gonna go ahead and use a thread that um, matches the color of the fabric I've used. Uh, it's not important that you see these stitches right here, because you can in the actual book. And don't worry, that prize is coming. <laughs> I know. I do this in events too. Okay, so I can give away this prize now. What I want you to type for holiday extravaganza is holiday. Lauren, you read my mind. <laughs> the, the word is holiday. Or Kronos and Classic and Vidibulum. If you actually type that and spell it correctly, you'll be in the front. <laughs> All right. So while they're going through, 
Again, that word is holiday for the holiday extravaganza, premium plus. I actually talk about this while I'm stitching out because uh, this one's phenomenal. Um, I actually uh, helped write most of this tutorial years ago when I was on the creative team, and um, I actually did a lot of these stitch outs. Uh, I wrote tutorials as well. Um, uh, before I worked in Steve's art studio, where I don't travel around and uh, do classes. And this one has a lot of different projects in it. Um, show it up close a little bit. Up there with lighting. Uh, but it has a lot of different projects. It shows you on the front and back, all Christmas themes, but it all has the same type of artwork. So it all coordinates with each other as well. Uh, you can also find this online, Holiday Extravaganza. It's a premium plus. Uh, typical price is $250. And it comes with the fully printed tutorial book if you get the physical copy. Again, uh, depending on where we have to send this to, we may just send you the digital, but you'll still get the entire tutorial. All right. As you can see, it's finishing up the last step here. It didn't just do a tack down stitch. It went back and did a lower density satin stitch as well. And that's really going to hold this drawstring to ba bag rather together um, when we flip it right side out and prevent it from tearing. We typically really only do this with a drawstring bag. So now we're going to move on. Did we get that uh, one thing? Oh, Karen Schlupp, you are our winner. Congratulations, Karen. We'll go ahead and get that all the extravagant out to you. I hope you enjoy. Uh, when you stick stuff out, um, which I hope you do, please send it over to us so we can see it and post it or just tag us in it on, if you're on Facebook, um, post it on your Facebook and tag us so everyone else can see as well. All right. So now we've got that um, final stitch done. We're on step F, remove the bag from the hoop. I'll just go ahead and pop the whole thing out. Uh, are you only saying that so I'll give another prize away? <laughs> but um, but that's okay. We won't we won't tell Taylor, or you can you can go ahead and tell Taylor. <laughs> Taylor and I have actually uh, done. We've worked together for well my six years that I've been here. Taylor's been here um, I think ten years actually. Uh, but we've uh, done one event together. And they haven't allowed us to do any more events together. I don't know why. I think we're both too much trouble. <laughs> we're out traveling. So I've um, removed it from the hoop, and it is inside out, as you can see. So we're going to flip over to step G. I've torn the excess tearaway away. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to go ahead and kind of speed through this. I'm not really going to clean it up as well as the pictures are showing you here. Uh, but I removed this excess. You can take all the stuff inside out, too. Um, you can, of course, remove that top layer, but I want to kind of get you through to the finishing steps here. So step H is saying use a rotary cutter to trim. I've just got some shears. I'm just going to trim it up. You can just do a quarter inch seam allowance on this. You can eyeball a quarter inch. A rotary cutter is going to make it look way prettier than what I'm doing with my little speed cut here. Me personally, if I can't see it, I don't care about it. But I know there's a lot of you that even if you can't see it, the quality of your work matters to you. So if you don't want it to look like that, then you can use a rotary cutter and uh, specific rulers to get a better cut around. But quarter inch is fine. Uh, it won't pull through. Step I, um, it should look something like this, hopefully. And we're going to step J, turn your bag right side out. So I've gone ahead and flipped it right side out. Um, now, depending on the type of machine you have and how it cuts your trims and everything else, you may have some little excess threads that you want to kind of clean up on the front um, from when it actually trims it and stuff. So you can do that at your leisure. You can clean up all the excess little stabilizer and everything else on there to make it look nicer. Um, and then we're going to take our drawstrings. Now, when you feed your drawstring through, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can put a paper clip through your drawstring, like you see there. And again, it tells you um, how long to cut these and everything else, but the, the length is, um, at the end of the day, really your preference. You can always cut it longer and then trim down to what you want. And the reason we have a paper clip is if you use a pin or something else, it's just gonna get caught in this actual channel, which is pretty typical. Um, so what I do is either use a paper clip or I use a, um, uh, uh, clothespin 
That's the word I was looking for there. And you're going to carefully just feed it through. Hopefully I'm not actually pulling the drawstring off the paper clip, uh, which is always fun when I do these events. Um, I mean, I'm doing it live with you, but when I do it in live groups also, everyone always enjoys it when I completely botch it and mess it up because it makes them feel better about if they're new messing things up. We all mess things up. Um, anytime I've given you a tip on anything, it's uh, because I've already made that mistake. Popping stuff out of the hoop, that whole sort of thing. So I've got my first one all the way through. Um, now you can wrap it back through the other end if you want, if you just want to kind of close it from one end, but these are cinched, so we're cinching them. <laughs> very technical term. Yes, I'm a very technical person. Um, so right now we're still on step K, uh, thread a piece of ribbon or rope, your preference, whatever you would like to use that will actually fit through the channel with ease. You don't want to put something that's a thicker um, gauge uh, than your actual channel there. And of course that channel is going to vary slightly depending on the size that you pick. Cut this little guy. And because I didn't clean up my bag, it kind of uh, caught a little bit on those scraggly stitches at the end there. So I've got that through there. And now once the ribbon or rope, uh, excuse me, once it has ribbon or rope, uh, can close, you can go ahead and pull it through just like step L. And we have again, lots of different bags that you can see there that all work wonderfully with each other. And oh, well, that was the last step, step L. So that is basically it. Now, again, this is going to be posted to uh, YouTube as well. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this uh, live stitch out with uh, Need a Good Design. And if you want to go get this project, just as a reminder, it is a Need is Express floral cinch bag that is still $10 off as of today, September 25th at 1995 is the actual price with a $10 off until tonight at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, then it goes back to its normal price, which is $29.95, so you can get it anytime you want. It's not going off the website. Um, and I believe uh, you guys said you were going to tag it, the link on YouTube as well? Yeah, we're going to send an email after Okay. And they'll send an email once it's up on YouTube, and I would tag a link to the website um, as to where to get it. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. So all that information will be right there for you. Um, so again, my name's Brian. If you have any questions whatsoever, uh, feel free to uh, just chime in um, uh, to Facebook. You can reach out to us through our website, customer experience at anitagooddesign.com is an email you can use as well. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. I'm glad I got to give away some prizes. Congratulations to our winner, and we'll see you next time.